All right, what's next, guys? Don, well, you want we're to gonna do uh, we're gonna do our metal six packs, and of course, uh, we're gonna uh, try to tie it in with our guest, as uh, I think is appropriate. And uh, we're gonna do the uh, it was Jim's suggestion, and a great one. We're gonna do our top six David Coverdale albums. So, that he uh, sang on, that he that sang he on whatever bands he was in that Coverdale was on. And exactly. if the fans want to join in, they can put it in the chat and we'll get to you guys in a little bit. And we do our stuff. If you pick, you guys want to pick your six top David Coverdale albums, but you want me to go first? Yeah. I yeah. think the order we've got this in is uh, Mr. Florentine, Mr. Jameson and Mr. Trunk. Uh, right. No Thank one, you, no one calls me Mr. Florentine. Yes. Nobody. Please. That's weird. Don't. <laughs> but thank well, you. Well, there shouldn't be apparently. there shouldn't be any misters in front of any of our names. <laughs> We're three creeps from New Jersey. <laughs> My number six pick is uh, Coverdale Page. Um, this was a pretty big album at the time, but you know I was reading about it. I didn't know like the tour. I guess uh, they didn't do that many dates, and there was I don't know. It, it kind of fell apart pretty quick, but I really like this record. It had a lot of buzz when it first came out. Sold a million copies, so that's my number six. Deep Purple, Stormbringer. That's the second album that uh, Coverdale sang with Deep Purple. Not as good as Burn, but it was very solid. I like that one. Number four, I love this record, White Snake Forevermore. That came out in maybe 2008. My Wedding Song was one of the songs that was yeah. on this record. <laughs> Even though that didn't work out, I still love this record. <laughs> Some amazing songs on here. Um, number three is the White Snake 87. Re no, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I messed it up. Slide it in. Number three, um, phenomenal. This is when I really started getting in the White Snake. Um, number two is White Snake '87. Um, the, what can you say? This is like the paranoid uh, with all the hits on and stuff like that. It's an incredible record, John Sykes. And number one is uh, Deep Purple Burn. Wow, you got Burn at one, huh? Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Nice. Fancy graphic. Yeah. Look at that. It's professional. Who's going next, yeah. Don? Jim, you don't tear up when you listen to that White Snake Forever album? Um, when I had to cut my ex a check, I did. <laughs> of course. I teared up. <laughs> um, all right, my number six, I don't blame you. Uh, my number six was that album, Forevermore, from 2011, and uh, just definitely one of the stronger, more recent uh, things that – uh, David has done with the band. I agree, Jim. I, I love this album. So many good tunes on here. Uh, number five. Now, we usually try to stay away from live stuff, but this one's kind of special. It's called Starkers in Tokyo. It's just Coverdale and Adrian Vandenberg acoustic playing White Snake songs. And it's just it's just really different. And, um, you know, the, the vocal on there is amazing. So I think that was only released in Japan. So a lot of people might not even know about that one. Um, number four, Coverdale Page. Man, what a great combination. Hope there's a sequel. Uh, definitely want to ask David about that. A part two to this definitely deserves it. Number three, ah, I, I had a tough time with this, Jim. I was going to go Stormbringer, but I got to go with Come Taste the Band. Um, wanted to get a little uh, Tommy Bolin love in there as well. Uh, I do think it's a stronger album overall, even though you don't have that one. So, like Stormbringer, the song is so powerful. Um, but this band, this this album, uh, stronger overall. Um, number two from '87, we love it, we know it, uh, can't live without it. But all that said, at number one from 1974. Burn. There you go. That's my list, everybody. And that's the correct order and the correct albums. Ed, let's wow. see. Wow. Wow. So no, no so, slide it in. No slide it in. Wow. Well, no, you could slide it into any of these albums, but uh, wow. yeah. It, it would have been number seven, Jim. Yeah. Good uh <laughs> good call on Starkers in Tokyo. I forgot all about that. I knew that one, but I was like, do I put it in? I already broke the rules last week and I said maybe because this is kind of like sort of like an import thing. That's great. The Starkers in Tokyo is phenomenal. By the way, we saw Adrian Vandenberg on the Monsters of Rock Cruise, and I saw him at the Dio event uh, a week or so ago. And he's got a singer in the band now that sounds exactly like David. And he just put out a brand new song called Sin. That's like seven minutes and ripping under the Vandenberg name. So check that out. And that Starker's record, I think David put that in one of the special editions of these recent records. You know, he's been going through his whole catalog. So yep. I think like I think around the time that he did 
Um, one of the more recent, maybe the record with Vandenberg, that's included in there, that record as a bonus. So, all right, I'll do mine now. By the way, we should tell the audience, we none of us know what everyone's going to have on their list. So yeah. we're, we're discovering this as we go. All right, here's mine. Starting at number six, I start with Come Taste the Band, which was the third and final Deep Purple album with Glenn Hughes and David Coverdale and the arrival of Tommy Bolin, the late, great Tommy Bolin on guitar. But a heads up on this. There is a remix of this record that was done about eight, nine years ago by Kevin Shirley that is killer. So I actually prefer the remix version, which is chunkier, more guitar, a little heavier. So check that out if you didn't know about that. But come taste the band at six. We're all in agreement on the more recent Best White Snake album. Wow. I've got Forevermore as well. Brian Tishy on drums, one of my favorites. Doug Aldridge, Steal Your Heart Away, all that stuff that's on there. Kick-ass record, my favorite of the more recent ones that David made. At right. number four, I've got Covered L. Page as well. I want to ask David how he got his name listed before Jimmy Page's name. Which we're ask him it that just a bit. it sounds better. Like Page Coverdale doesn't flow. Coverdale Page flows better, I think. That's a nice way to put it, but he yeah. just got ahead of the Zeppelin guy. <laughs> I, I mean, the founder of Led Zeppelin. So I gotta I gotta ask that. That's my question. The thing that I love too about this record is I love the drumming of Denny Carmasi. If you know who he is, his first record was the first Montrose record. He played in Heart. He's retired now, but I love his playing. And he kills it on the tracks he plays on on that record as well. But, um, yeah, it would have been great if that would have continued, but obviously it didn't. David's been talking about a special edition of this record. Again, we can ask him about that because he's going to be on with us in a few minutes. At number three, the first album that the world ever heard David Coverdale on. Mm -hmm. Young kid, like 21, was selling shoes or something, and Deep Purple plucks him out of obscurity and puts him into one of the biggest global bands in the world. And what a record they made with Glenn Hughes coming in from Trapeze, the Burn album, the title track alone, as great and as epic as it gets. At number two, I've got Slide It In, which is really, at least in America, where the world discovered White Snake, and it really set the table for the 87 record. For those that are hardcore, you know there's two versions of Slide It In, the original version with the original guitar players on it, and then a version with John Sykes' guitar overdubbed in a remix. That's the version that came out in America. That's the better version. That's the version that everybody knows in the U.S. And that's the version that I'm putting at number two. And at number one, I don't. I can't even. Not it wasn't even hard for me. The '87 record all the way. I mean, I'm a psycho John Sykes fan. We miss him. I hope he's okay. I wish he'd do something like everyone else, but. My God, that record, the enormity of that guitar playing and those songs, just what else can you say? Still of the Night, the riff. The riff in Still of the Night alone puts it at number one. Enough right. said, 87 at number one. All right, let's see what the uh, what the fans think. Yeah, let's see if uh, – should we, should we go right to stand up and, and shout and, and talk to some folks here? Or? Yeah, well, I just wanted to – yeah, I just wanted to see what some of the here. fans' uh, response was to their top six or what they thought of these records and stuff. But, yeah, we can go to uh... – yeah, I mean, Page, he's... Best music Jimmy Page put out post-Zeppelin, according to Eric Beback. I, I think that's true. I mean, the I firm was decent, did. but I, I, the Coverdale Page record was great. Did he put out anything after? <laughs> I mean, Jimmy Page, is all he's been doing is working the Zeppelin catalog. He's not really done much. So I don't know if there was anything after that, actually. All right, yeah, like yeah, original that. and new. Well, he did. Uh, yeah, well, he did the the album with the Black Crows. No. Oh yeah, that was after, right? Yeah. But I still uh, think uh, the cover the Coverdale Page. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Coverdale Page was that, it's better, better album. Kyle with Love Hunter going back to the pre and Saints and Sinners wow. and Ready and Willing, all the earlier White Snake records, which were I'd be curious to know where Kyle's from because those were really big records in, in Europe, but they didn't really break in America. Yeah, they didn't really do it. But um, no, I, I like the- Great songs the on there. The, yeah, Crying in the Rain and too. Here I Go Again came from those early records and were redone on 87, as most yep. people know. So, yep, yep. 